So hello and welcome back to uh, another lecture in the F110 Autonomous Racing course. Uh, in this video, we will continue uh, on the topic which we uh, introduced in the, in the previous lecture, uh, which was really related to perception and more importantly, uh, localization of the uh, one tenth scale vehicle. And uh, towards the end of the previous lecture, I had provided some basic sort of intuition on a key method which uses LIDAR in order to determine our, um, our position in the world or pose in the world through a algorithm or a method called scan matching. And so in today's video, I will uh, go deep into scan matching. That's the only topic that I want to discuss. Uh, so we will sort of recap with, you know, the, the intuition about scan matching. I'll pick up from where I left in the, in the previous lecture just to give you a quick recap of what the main idea was. Uh, and then this is going to be one of those lectures where we go into a lot of examples, uh, including looking at the math behind uh, making uh, some of this work. And so uh, let's just begin from where we uh, ended in the previous lecture. Uh, and so re recall the uh, need for scan matching arose from the limitations of techniques like dead reckoning that we had discussed previously. And in particular, there was no feedback mechanism to correct for the errors which get accumulated over time, uh, whether you are using wheel encoders or IMU uh, data to estimate your position in the world using odometry or dead reckoning type methods. And so that's why we needed something which is a little bit more robust, which can uh, tell us if where we are based on where we were and can also you know, sense the surroundings and bring that perception data uh, into the mix uh, when you uh, want to determine your position of the robot in the world, or in our case, the position of the 110 scale vehicle. So I'll go over this uh, intuition just uh, very quickly again to set the, uh, the background for what's to follow in this, in this lecture. Uh, so remember our, our setting was that we have uh, a vehicle or F110 car in a hallway, right? So you have seen many videos. We typically test these vehicles in our lab in hallways or some dedicated tracks. But either ways, there's always like a left and a right boundary that the LiDAR uh, range sensor can always detect. And so what we had discussed was that at, at some time, um, you get a scan from the LiDAR. The scan is just a sequence of point measurements. And we had discussed how the Hakuyo uh, 2D laser scanner uh, on the vehicle, uh, it uh, you know sw sweeps in these fixed increments and gives about a thousand something points uh, for every uh, scan that it does. And it does it uh, you know, at 20 or 40 hertz per second, or 40 times a second. So this is just an example of what that scan might look like. We are just showing a subset of the scan and not the entire field of view, obviously. And then the, the idea was, uh, let's say we know where we were to begin with, right? So someone actually placed the car uh, at some position uh, known to us in the frame of reference of the world. And sometimes uh, in the subsequent lecture, we'll have a dedicated discussion about these different frames that are very valuable for localization, mapping, and odometry. Uh, and so you can think of this as the, you know, the map frame, right? So we have a map of the environment or the world frame. Uh, it has its origin somewhere. And then we have placed the car uh, at a known position in the world coordinates, right? So everything is good so far. We know where the car is. There's no localization to be solved. And at that time or at that instant, we get a scan which we know is a function of the uh, position of the car, right? So what the car sees on the left-hand wall uh, is obviously going to depend or reflect where it was in the world coordinates. And so that's the key behind this idea that we will exploit later, that what you see in the local frame of reference or in this orange frame of reference of the car, because remember the LiDAR scan is not in the world coordinates, it's in the coordinates of the sensor itself and the LiDAR is placed, let's say, on the top of the car. So we are observing the scan in the frame of reference of the car, but we know the position of the car in the frame of reference of the world. So there's a relationship there. So in, in itself, there's nothing to be solved because we know where the car is, like I said earlier. The problem arises that when you get a subsequent scan, so at some point later, you get a new scan, which should reflect where the car is in the frame of reference of the world, but this is not known to us, right? So where the car has moved is not known. 
The only thing we get to observe is this new scan, but that's in the frame of reference again of the vehicle and not in the global frame of reference. And so the idea is using this knowledge of scan one as a function of the new position and the scan of the LIDAR as a function of the previous position, can we figure out how have we moved or traversed uh, in this environment or a hallway, right? So, so that's in a nutshell, the inverse problem that we have to solve. Uh, and the problem is that, you know, we don't know how far we have traveled and which direction we are facing. All we know is uh, if you want to think and it helps uh, to make it easier in terms of time, uh, at time zero, we knew where we were and we had some data from our LIDAR. And at time one, we just get the new data from the LIDAR, but we don't know where we are. And that's the problem we are trying to solve. Can we use this new data from our primary perception sensor to figure out where we are and how we have moved in this world? And the idea, as we had discussed, was very clever. Uh, if there was a way to overlap some of the features of the LIDAR scans, right? So this, there's a reason why uh, I have shown the left wall uh, as this uh, you know, non-smooth surface to highlight that these surface, the surface has some features, right? It has these valleys and peaks uh, which are the profile of the, of the surface itself. So if there was a way to overlap some of these features in subsequent scans, that could be one way to infer how we have moved or what is the highest likelihood uh, that describes our position because it justifies the observation of the new scan. And that's really uh, the, the key in this uh, entire uh, lecture, which is called scan matching uh, algorithm, that the most likely position of our car is the one which results in the maximum overlap between our current observation and our historical observation, right? So if we can overlap these scans or part of these scans, and that's the hard part and the tricky part that we will go more in detail uh, in this video, if we can match some features between subsequent scans and overlap them, uh, then that will likely tell us how far and what direction did we, are we facing uh, in this new instance when we get the fresh uh, data, right? So, so that was the intuition of scan matching. And remember, we knew where we were and we had to estimate where we are. Where we are. We had to estimate in the frame of reference of the map or the world, and all we observe is data in the frame of reference uh, of the vehicle right, or the sensor. So, so that's the that's the key thing to remember that the perception is in the frame of reference of the vehicle or the sensor, whereas we want to use the knowledge of historical data, historical map, or historical scans uh, to figure out how we have moved in the frame of reference of the world because knowing where you are in the frame of reference of the world is the localization problem as we have discussed uh, quite uh, quite uh, in detail in the in the last video okay so that was a very rapid but hopefully a uh, good recap of the intuition behind scan matching and then obviously there is some math to follow and last time i didn't even bother explaining this uh, optimization uh, but in a nutshell what this is trying to do is you are measuring for every um, for every point in the point cloud of the LIDAR, so t a thousand something points, you are measuring uh, the overlap between a previous scan and the current scan. And so uh, this is still being simplified because I haven't explained what this measurement or uh, what is the measure of this correlation between the scans or the overlap. And you know that's really uh, what the what the math will reveal shortly. Okay, so here's a, a quick video of uh, how this works in practice. This is, I believe, a demo uh, from AutoWare from a couple of years ago. Uh, and so you can see uh, in, the, in the main video, we see the pose of the vehicle with this red arrow. We see the incoming or the fresh LiDAR data uh, shown in these concentric circles. And then you can see how, uh, you know, the... Uh, some part of the scan overlaps with these landmarks or features in the world, and that is being used to infer the real-time position of the car. Now, uh, I, I must say that there might be something more going on here in the sense that we are fusing this knowledge from the from the laser scan and scan matching uh, with GPS, likely to get us a you know a, a, some level of redundancy and maybe even odometry using IMU. Uh, but in a nutshell, what you see is you have a, 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 
uh, LiDAR data, which is being used to infer how the car is moving in the world. Uh, and uh, it, it's working pretty well, right? Right now, I think it's just waiting for the light to turn green. There we go. You can see in the top uh, right corner, uh, sort of a dash cam footage of what is happening. And even when the car turns, uh, we get, you know, uh, and you can see actually in the LiDAR, the reason why it paused was because uh, there seemed to be a, a pedestrian which appeared. That's just, you know, a, a separate discussion because in the one-tenth world, we won't have pedestrians. We will have obstacles though. But that's not the point of this video. The point was to show how uh, the laser scan messages in a 3D environment, which is much more complex than my simple toy example, um, the scan matching will still work. In fact, the specific algorithm that is likely being used here is called NDT scan matching. And towards the very end of this video, uh, I will show you what NDT scan matching is. So let's dive in a little bit deeper into uh, the, the setup or the math of uh, you know what is happening uh, in between these subsequent scans. So here is sort of a similar picture, but it's even more uh, uh, reduced and simplified because I just want to focus on the mechanics of uh, how we are determining this overlap, what is this measurement of closeness between subsequent scans and things like that. So, so let's speak in even more generic terms. Let's say the robot is in some environment and um, this is the frame of reference of the robot uh, shown in green. And here are some, some features, right? This is kind of a reduced picture of the left-hand side wall. Uh, but here I have highlighted some you know, geometric properties or features of the, of the surface that is visible to my robot. Um, and so we can think of a, a global frame of reference shown here with the, with the black coloring and the black axis. Uh, and in this global frame of reference, if we were to just plot uh, what ABC, where ABC are, it would look maybe something like this, right? So uh, you can see relative to the origin of the map frame or the global frame, uh, ABC is like in the first uh, top right quadrant and which is what is shown here. And similarly, we can say, well, what, what do these features look like in the frame of reference of uh, my robot, which is, uh, you know, the green axis. And so uh, this is what we can think of as the local frame. And uh, once again, the, the features may appear like that in the frame of reference of, of the robot, right? So this is at time zero, or you can say scan zero, um, and these are essentially measurements of the distances of ABC uh, from the, the main sensor, which in this case is at the origin of the uh, frame of reference uh, on the vehicle itself. Okay, so I hope the setup of the problem is clear. Nothing exciting has happened yet. We are just defining the local and the global frame and, and trying to uh, you know, do this thought experiment of what these features will look like in both the global frame and the local frame. And so then um, at time t equal to one, some movement of the robot occurs uh, in an unknown direction, right? The only thing that we observe actually is that the, the features A, B, and C, they will appear differently in my, uh, in my local frame of reference, right? So at time zero, remember this was the picture of how these features appeared in the uh, frame of reference of the robot and we are saying at time t1 um, you know in the same frame of reference we might see something like this now sure i mean if you look at the picture carefully uh, this is not quite right because uh, i think one point should be you know above the x-axis and one uh, below and one point is almost aligned uh, but you get the idea right we get us we get a new scan of the same features at some other time t equal to one and what we want to infer is, can we find a transformation that will take this new geometric feature representation in the same frame of reference uh, and superimpose it with my previously known um, you know, view of the same feature. So, so what's the transform R in this case, which transforms the set of new points to be the closest to the set of known uh, points at the previous time or at the previous scan. And the reason why we want to find this transformation, here is the, you know, the uh, uh, take home message that the same transformation can be applied to the position of the, the vehicle uh, to infer what is the new position of the vehicle. So the transform which leads to the 
closest match between subsequent points is the same transform uh, that will represent how the robot has moved uh, in time in this environment. And, and that's again consistent with you know, the, the intuition that we did earlier. So, so with this insight, I want you to think about, you know, why is this a hard problem? So looks like we get some scans uh, at every time step. Uh, we have historical scan information. In this case, we are just worried about just the immediately previous time step, not like a history of scans, uh, which by the way, you can think of a history of scans as a map. And we are not yet talking about mapping, but that's really what it is. So, but going back to what I want you to think about, you know, why is this uh, such a hard problem? Like what's the big deal, right? So you have to, uh, looks like this is just a simple geometry calculation uh, that given to a set of vectors or given coordinates in a 2D plane, you have to find this, uh, you know, transform, uh, which minimizes the distance between the, the shapes or the coordinate positions. So, so why do you think that this is a, a, a difficult problem? Or in other words, what do you think is the most challenging piece of this story? Is it finding R or would it be something else? So, so think about it. I'll, I'll maybe even pause for, for a bit to, to see if you can come up with your own ideas. Um, and yes, while it is not trivial to compute are what really the efficacy or the effectiveness of your solution at the end of the way, at the end of the day, it will depend upon is without explaining, I very conveniently assume that at time t0, we knew uh, you know the, the, the features a, b, and c. And at time t1, I very conveniently assumed that I know exactly where A, B, and C are on this new scan. And that's actually a big assumption, right? So I'm assuming I know where the features are in every scan. And that's actually one of the hardest things to do in scan matching. And uh, you'll see later that this is sometimes, this is often called the correspondence match problem. Uh, you have to figure out which points on the new scan correspond to previous points on your old scan, because there will be some points which disappear out of the field of view. And there will be some points in the new scan which were not part of your old scan. So it's not that trivial to you know, figure out exactly which points are uh, belong to which features. Uh, so that in fact is one of the hardest challenges in scan matching. But for, for the time being, you know, so yeah, exactly what, what this slide is saying. If we knew exactly where A, B, and C or the landmarks were, this would be very easy because then we are just doing some geometry calculation to determine R. But the thing is this point too, we don't know which measurements are for which landmark. And so, so that's why we need some clever ways of figuring out this correspondence match between subsequent scans. And that's why it's not that easy to, to compute R. Okay, so, so I hope the, the challenge is clear that if you did not know that in the new scan, where is C, where is A, and where is B, then how are you overlapping with your you know, original time zero scan? That's really the, the problem. So who is telling me which Oracle is revealing uh, that here is ABC? Because if, if I knew that information, then this problem is dead simple. And the thing which makes it hard is, I don't know exactly that's correspondence match. So what we do instead is the following, we iteratively search, right? So there's a recursion uh, uh, algorithm, recursive algorithm, which iteratively tries to find this best transform R that will take my new scan data and transform it such that it has the best match with the old uh, scan information. So uh, at the simplest level, we do the following, we, we just guess some reasonable R, okay? So we guess some value of R. Um, so here's my first pause or first question. Who can, or what can provide us? And you wanted to localize your car. Uh, do we know of something that we have all already studied, uh, which can give us a good guess of where we are in the world without even using any scan information? And so if you, came up with odometry or dead reckoning, you would be 100% right, right? Because 
the problem with dead reckoning or odometry was that we couldn't correct for drift or feedback, but it at least gave us some good basis or a good guess in terms of where we were, right? At least we knew the direction or the, uh, the extent to which we have moved with some uncertainty, of course. So that could be a good idea that you can use to make that initial guess, uh, just as a side, uh, side comment over here. So let's say we take an initial guess for the rotation, then for each point in the new scan, so for time t equals k plus one, uh, we trans we find the the closest point between the new scan and the uh, and the previous scan uh, by transforming the new scan with this rotation that we guessed. Okay, so we take the previous scan, we transform it into uh, a different position in the two D plane uh, for our example, uh, and then we find the closest points between the two scans, uh, which is called correspondence matching or correspondence search. Uh, and then we look at how close this is and based on whether or not, you know, it's close enough or it's further apart than some other transform, we will improve our, our guess of the actual transform, right? So, so we look at the correspondence and then we make a better guess for our and we keep repeating until we have some form of convergence. Now, uh, the thing which is in quotes, uh, the reason for that is I haven't explained, uh, you know, what is a better guess, right? So what is this, uh, how are we correlating or finding how close is my transform scan to my original scan? So, so let me go back to my simple example to give you uh, another intuition for uh, how do we compare different transformations. So, so in this picture, let's assume that someone has again told me that in the new scan, where are the landmarks? So I know which points correspond to ABC. So that's why this assumption is stated up top that we assume that the correspondences have been found. The question on at hand is, uh, let's say I have two candidate transforms. I have transform one, which will you know bring me to this, uh, this blue purple transform here and then have transform two, which is this orange transform, right? So, so these are possible candidate or guesses. And I want to answer uh, how do I uh, choose between, uh, you know, transform one or transform two? What is the metric that we use to uh, compare these possible candidates uh, to uh, do this iterative improvement? Um, so here is one idea. Since we know the correspondences, uh, what we can look at is we look at, uh, the transformed scan. So this this is you know some transformation applied to scan uh, at time t equal to one, and this is my scan at time t equal to zero. And so uh, this is just a simple like Euclidean geometry. And what we are trying to figure out is um, well, what is the closest point between every point in my transformed scan and my previous uh, uh, known scan? And so in this picture, visually, roughly speaking, B for point B, the closest is point three. Uh, and so, you know, we have some distance B prime, which is the, the, the closest distance. Uh, and then we have similarly for point C, the closest would also be point three. For point A, it looks like point one would be the closest, right? So we have these closest distances. And so then we can just sum these distances point-wise uh, and we can come up with some you know score which is just the uh, the uh, the sum of this projected or the sum of this point wise point to point distances between the uh, candidate transform scan and the uh, scan at the previous time step and so then we can do this for different uh, different candidates as well right so so we can do this for um, we can do this to to uh, to this other uh, transform as well, which is you know rotation two, and here um, essentially we are computing the the overlapping score between each candidate uh, rotation transform or each candidate transform. I shouldn't just call it rotation because it's actually both rotation and translation. Um, so we are computing the score for for a given uh, value or a guess for our transform. And then because this score represents the distance, pointwise distance to the original scan, uh, 
if we have two candidates, we will always choose the one which has a less sum of distance or sum of squared distance, right? That doesn't make sense because the score represents the sum of squared distance, pointwise distance between the transformed scan data and the original scan. And so if you score low, that means you were closer to the uh, previous time step, uh, the scan at the previous time step. And so this is our sort of the metric, right? It's just distance metric in terms of this point to point uh, measurement. Now, once again, I, I should emphasize that this only works because I know where in my scan are, are the three points that I'm interested in looking at the distances from, right? So if I don't even know that, then this problem is, is difficult. And so in a nutshell, what iterative closest point does is it uses this idea of the scoring of the distance, uh, the sum of squared distance or a similar metric to make adjustments or improvements which slowly make us converge to the original scan position. And this is again, once you have solved the correspondence points or the correspondence search problem, right? So, um, so this is what is the iterative part about uh, uh, the iterative closest point. So this algorithm is called ICP or iterative closest point. Um, and so you repeat this you know, same thing again and again until you converge to a solution. And the winning candidate, which in this case, let me see if I can draw a straight line. A winning candidate would be some you know, transform like that, which, which takes all of this new data and overlaps it with the original position. And then this transform, let's call it capital T, uh, when applied to the previous known position in the world coordinate of the car, if you transform that with the same um, function, it will give us the position of the car uh, at the new time step, right? That's what, what scan matching does. Okay, so I hope this sort of clarifies some of the questions that you may have about uh, what is closeness and how do you progress to, to this uh, solution. Uh, and then now I'll switch over to, uh, you know, um, uh, in a bit on how do you actually figure this, this correspondence stuff out. Right, so just another recap of the algorithm. Uh, you have a scan at time t minus one and you have a scan at the current time. Then we make an initial guess of this transformation Q naught. Uh, it's called roto transformation because it's a rotation plus translation. Then we uh, look at you know the the, the uh, output of the algorithm. So this is the input of the algorithm. The output of the algorithm is the best transformation, which describes the uh, which leads to the uh, closest point or the closest distance between the transformed. Um, new scan or a current scan and the previous scan, right? So we are looking for that Q star as the winning candidate for the, for the transform which uh, this algorithm ICP will, uh, will return. And so it does that by looking at the, uh, the current scan and transforming the current scan into the same frame of, frame of reference as the previous scan. And then once you do this transform, you find the closest point to point or so, you know, I haven't explained point to line yet. So we can stick with you find the closest point to point correspondence. Um, you evaluate it using some score. Uh, and, you know, we, we do that with some objective function uh, and that um, the scan which leads to the minimization of that error in that, in this case, the error is the sum of distances between the uh, the transformed current scan and the previous scan, uh, that is what will be eventually uh, returned as the output of the ICP algorithm. Okay, so so this is still somewhat in the realm of intuition, I haven't gone too much detail into the mathematics of it, uh, other than the fact that we have defined uh, what is closeness, it's literally some, you know, a measure of distance in 2D Euclidean distance works. Um, but we'll look at some other other metrics as well, right? So right now we've only looked at point to point distances. And then the thing which is still not clear is how do you find these corresponding points? So, so let's take a step back from the F110 world and just go into uh, the world of uh, iterative closest point or ICP algorithm. 
Uh, this, by the way, is not unique to uh, self-driving cars. It's not even unique to, um, I would say, LiDAR data, although that is the most uh, uh, widely uh, uh, implemented uh, uh, you know, instance of ICP. Uh, you can even do this with images, right? So you can think of, uh, it's just doing feature map matching. So uh, in an image, you can have features which are pixels and then your car moves and you get a new image and you want to, you know, look at the best transform between the same features across multiple images and that will give you an indication of how you moved in the world to produce that new image right so that's again just one of many users of icp it's used a lot in medical imaging as well um, so let's maybe spend some time just understanding or uh, going over some attributes of the icp algorithm that are good to know uh, and then you will you know, bring it back into the F110 world and I'll show you exactly which ROS packages do this. So you don't have to write your own uh, ICP algorithm, but I think it would help to uh, uh, give you a new appreciation for how cool this is and why it works so well. Okay, so so let's say we are, uh, we are given two sets of points and, you know, um, it doesn't really matter if these are LiDAR points, but if it helps, uh, let's consider them as, as LiDAR points. So, so we are given two generic sets uh, of, uh, of points, um, n points each, uh, denoted by uh, x, the set x, and the set p. And so, you know, um, you can think of one of them as the previous scan, the points corresponding to the LiDAR uh, scan at the, at the previous time steps, and maybe uh, we can consider p as the current uh, scan, right? So uh, just to associate it back to what we were discussing. Uh, but this is generic, right? This is not specific to uh, self-driving cars. So we have the problem that we have two sets of points. And what we want to figure out uh, is that what is the translation T and the rotation R that minimizes the uh, sum of the squared error between X and the transformed uh, points P, right? So we are taking each point in the set P we are rotating it using this rotation matrix R and then translating it using this vector T. And that will, let's say, give us, you know, PI uh, prime. And then we are looking at element-wise difference between XI and PI. And we are looking at the sum of the squared distance between, uh, between you know, all of these points. So, so, so that's the generic problem. We want to find r and t such that we minimize the sum of squared error right so this is my objective function the thing we are assuming once again is that we are considering xi and pi as corresponding points what does that mean it means that uh, we already know that x of i must be compared to the position pi so we know this correspondence exists between them so once again, you know, this is a simplified uh, view of the problem. So if this correspondence is correct and precise, if it is known, then this problem of minimizing and finding the optimal values of R and T such that this error is minimized, this is what is called uh, analytical problem and it can be calculated uh, essentially in one step. Right, so, so it can be calculated in just a single step and that's why it sometimes is called, this is a closed form solution. So you can go from, uh, let's say your, you have your X and you have your P and we know exactly the correspondence between them, then this is essentially you know, a single, single step to get to the solution. Uh, in fact, I can show you why it's a single step because all you really need to do is you need to uh, think of a centroid or a center of mass of each of your data sets. So we look at the mean value of X, which is just the simple equation, and we look at the mean value of P, and then we transfer, we, you know, we, uh, what we call, we um, uh, centralize, normalize and center our data. Well, this is not really normalization, we are just centering our data. So we are subtracting the mean from every point. Okay, so each, point in the transformed sets x prime and p prime is the original point minus the mean um, the the mean of the uh, of the same points or the center of mass or the centroid of the same points so now we get new sets uh, x i prime and p i prime and um, we haven't done anything 
you know, um, yet to figure out the transform, but uh, without showing you the proof, the uh, thing to compute is this matrix W, which is uh, this, you know, uh, dot product of the, the, uh, the vector Xi prime and Pi prime. And then this matrix W uh, would be a square matrix because each of them is one by n and one by n. So this would be like a n by n matrix. And then we would do what is called a singular value decomposition of W. Uh, if you don't remember what SVD is, uh, I encourage you to pause here and go and look it up. Uh, but it's just a property of these uh, square symmetric matrices that you can decompose them into the following format. So you can rewrite W as a product of, uh, let's say, U times this matrix, diagonal matrix times uh, V, where U and V are themselves matrices, and then the, the diagonal matrix, uh, the values on the diagonal are what are called the singular values, or sometimes they are the eigenvalues of W, right? So this is now getting into a little bit of matrix algebra. And I haven't explained why we are computing W yet, but this is one of the steps uh, in order to figure out the uh, value of R and T, which minimize that sum of squared distance. So once you have computed W and you have uh, you know, decomposed it into its singular value uh, decomposition, uh, the reason you did that is because we would need the U and the V to compute our R and T. And so the last step, again, omitting the entire proof, is that the value of the rotation matrix is given by this matrix, which is just U times uh, the transpose of the matrix V. And the value of the translation is given by the mean of X uh, minus the mean of P uh, uh, multiplied by the transformation matrix R. So, so really in a single shot, just by knowing the mean of X and the mean of P and computing uh, U and V from W. So remember U and V came from the singular value decomposition of W. This came from like a product of X prime and P prime and each of these in turn was x minus ux and this was you know p minus the mean of p so what we were given was just x and p from there we computed the mean then we computed this uh, sort of uh, you know the centralized value of the uh, of the two sets we used that to compute a matrix we decompose the matrix and that will give me the optimal value of the rotation which i can plug to get me the optimal value of translation. In fact, again, without showing you, you can confirm this later, that the, the value of the error itself is given by this expression, where I think this should be pi, not yi. Okay, so, so all of this to, to tell you why this problem is easy. If the correspondences are known, then this is a single shot process, okay? And there's again software that does it for you. Now the problem is that we don't know the correspondences. Right? So if the correct correspondences are not known, then it's impossible to do this in a single step. That's why we need this recursion idea. Right? So in reality, we would have our uh, previous set and the new set or the previous scan and the new scan. And we would not know which points on my new scan correspond to which points on the previous scan, right? So I don't know this correspondence. And so therefore I need a heuristic or some way to make a reasonable guess. Uh, and if my guess is close enough, then you know the, the process of scoring and choosing a better transform uh, through this iterative process uh, becomes easier. So the idea is to, to, to find this alignment and the ICP uh, works when you're uh, starting positions are, are close enough. So what are some candidates for reasonable suggestions for uh, figuring out these correspondences because they're not known to us? So um, some of them are, um, you know, well, before we get to the, uh, the different, uh, different types of correspondence matches, um, you can also do a lot of different things with ICP. 
the key idea is of course to minimize that objective function uh, one thing that you sometimes do is um, you cannot you can you know drop out some some points from each of the data sets so i'll give you an example in just a second uh, if you have millions of points to match like you would with the with the powerful 3d uh, lidar uh, today or even you know multiple lidars giving you millions of points uh, then you can't be solving this you know closest point with a million uh, uh, with when xnp contains millions of points that's going to take forever so so and especially when we don't even know the correspondences so sometimes you just work with a subset of the points sometimes you can prioritize uh, some uh, some points carry higher weight so if you can get your transformation to um, match the points with higher weights together better then it's you know uh, that will be the candidate winning transformation so and think of it as we were treating each point in x and p as uh, equally important but in our error function when we were uh, looking at the difference let me maybe go back uh, to tell you what i'm talking about um, in this function right here uh, we can say that you know certain points xj and xk uh, they have some weight j and weight k associated with them so we are giving them some higher importance why because there may be some important features that we don't want to miss and we want our algorithm to pay attention to them so that's what you know point two means uh, and then you know again you can uh, do some outlier detection and uh, some other ways of association that we will look at shortly uh, why would you choose different ways uh, one versus the other the closeness is is the criteria which is like say the accuracy of icp in terms of figuring out the best match but there are other considerations right so computation uh, the stability of the algorithm to get stuck in some local guess and not make progress towards this converging optimal solution uh, how fast it runs is it robust to outliers so many many different factors besides just the raw accuracy or performance um, should be taken into consideration when we use this in the in the real world. Yeah, so let's look at you know selecting these uh, source points. So I already said we can use all the data there is. That's sort of making use of every single point in the subset X and P. Uh, you can do some random sampling or some uniform sampling, or you can do what is called feature-based sampling where the idea really is that uh, instead of looking at raw points, we are going to be looking at uh, um, features of the raw points and using features to, to do scan matching. And actually one very popular way of doing that is what is called um, a normal space sensing, uh, normal space sampling, sorry. Uh, and uh, that's also the basis of this very popular algorithm called NDT uh, scan matching, which is used in full scale vehicles. And I'll give you a, a brief reprise on that uh, uh, in the remainder of this video. Okay, so in a nutshell, what, what feature-based uh, sampling does is, uh, instead of dealing with all the raw uh, LIDAR points, uh, we want to only uh, you know, look at uh, a subset of points or features, which are combination of points. So because what it does is it just reduces the, the matching space, right? So I'm not uh, looking at, let's say, X, the, the set X as XI all the way to, you know, X uh, uh, 500,000 or 200,000. What I'm saying is maybe some parts of this sequence of points can be considered as a feature. So maybe we can say XF, the set, the same set X, but in feature space is a set of features fi to just say f5000 right so it's a it's an order of magnitude reduction in the number of things we have to worry about and that's really what this uh, this slide is trying to communicate right so uh, definitely requires some pruning or pre-processing how do you get the features to begin with um, and so there's a trade off there how much compute you spend on just extracting features versus how much computation you uh, save by using features instead of points for the scan matching algorithm. So uh, as, as an example, we have a 3D scan on the bottom left and a corresponding uh, feature representation uh, of the same scan on the bottom right. 
Uh, and so you can see this will reduce a lot of computation time for us. So, so let's look at the, the problem of finding the, 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 the correspondence match or the closest match. Um, we haven't really discussed this yet and I want to throw out some ideas um, and say that, you know, just like with every other aspect of ICP, this is also uh, like a heuristic where there are many candidates and many possible approaches. And we we'll look at a couple of them and we'll go into detail in, in one particular approach called uh, point to line um, rather than point to point. So uh, the obvious one is that if you have uh, your, uh, your, let's say your previous, your previous scan and your new scan, we simply look at the point on the new scan, which is closest to the point on the, the previous scan, right? So that's why it's called closest point matching. So you don't need to know the exact correspondence. We know that the new scan will have some shifted data or some new data or missing data, but we don't care. We just look at the closest point and that's the metric we will use to find the best match between the set P and X. Uh, and so in general, this is stable, but as you can imagine, it's slow and it requires a lot of pre-processing. Another way is that we look at the previous scan or the previous set, and for each point, we draw a normal, and instead of the closest point, like in the previous slide, we are looking at where does this normal intersect, you know, my my sort of new new data. And maybe that intersection is right here. And so we will take this point P i as the corresponding point to X i and not the point which might be geometrically uh, more closer to X i like in the closest point matching. So this is called like normal uh, uh, point matching or normal shooting or some other uh, you know similar names. So it's slightly better uh, for um, for scans which have smooth structures. Smooth means you know you don't have any kind of sharp edges or uh, things like that in the scan. It's uh, it's continuous, uh, and so but it becomes worse for complex structures. Okay, so and th this is why it's ad hoc or heuristic because there's no uh, one trick which works in all all possible cases. And then the last one I want to describe is point to plane. Sometimes it's also called point to line for like two D scans. Uh, and essentially, what this is saying is that you have a point x i. Uh, and instead of maybe you know using the normal or the closest distance, what you are doing is you are looking at the new scan P and you are trying to find this projection of the scan of the point XI to the line segment uh, between let's say subsequent points in uh, in this uh, uh, scan P, right? So you are using a point to plane or a point to line projection rather than the closest distance or the normal mm -hmm. distance. And this has a good advantage uh, in, in certain situations and I'll actually go into an example where I'll show you why this is faster. This can sometimes lead to a faster corresponding match so it reduces the number of uh, iterations that ICP has to go through. So, so that's that was sort of the last piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, what are the ways to find the correspondence match because we don't know this to begin with as we have been assuming in all our examples. So, so this was to uh, give you an idea of uh, some possible candidates there. Uh, and then we'll focus on point to line with a, with a sort of one of the last examples of this video. And I'll compare that to point to point to give you some more intuition and, and again, based on some math as well. Uh, before that, uh, I said this earlier that we have been looking at just point sets, right? So my example began with the set X and P, which are sort of the scans of the LiDAR at time T0 and time T1, and that's sort of the, the view of the problem. But ICP as an algorithm can extend to other geometric uh, patterns or modalities. So you could even, um, you know, uh, do um, iterative closest for uh, polylines or for line segments, or you could do iterative closest algorithm for meshes. And that's why there's such a versatile approach, uh, but it still uses this very simple idea that when I get new data, can I uh, do some correspondence matching to find the closest overlap with my previous data? And that's a very useful thing to know in many, many domains. And so because of this, uh, another thing I want to mention is 
the view of our problem so far is um, what we call scan to scan, meaning we have a scan at time t k plus one, and we are you know figuring out what is the uh, uh, transform to uh, using ICP that gives me the best overlap at the scan at time t k. Um, but there is nothing which prevents me from replacing the scan at time t k with a pre-built map of the environment, right? So, so instead of comparing my current scan to the previous scan, I can just compare my current scan to a previous LiDAR map of the environment. In fact, if you remember um, in the previous video, I had even shown you this as an example where you know we, we had a cartoon map and then we had a, like some kind of a, you know, a puzzle piece and then I asked you where in the map is this puzzle piece. So there, your puzzle piece was the scan at time t k plus one, and your previous scan was not a single scan, it was a map. And you know, we had figured out that uh, the artifact uh, or the shape and the size of this uh, correspond to some region in, in this map. But you are still solving the same problem, right? Instead of just searching over the set X, which was the historical set, you are now searching over a map M. Uh, and you're trying to search where in the map is the best fit of my current scan, uh, and that will tell me my position in the map. Okay, so, so you can do scan to map, and similarly, you can do map to map and many other variants of this as well, right? So, so keep that in mind because uh, that's one of the ways that we will use to build our map uh, using an algorithm called the Hector Slam, which uses scan matching to build a map of the environment and to localize the F110 car in the map itself. Okay, so to conclude this lecture, I want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, first one is, let's get more into detail of uh, why would you choose one correspondence matching criteria versus the other? And in particular, I'll again look at a simple example because it can get very complicated in higher dimensions. Uh, but we want to compare point to point, uh, closest point matching that we just covered versus point to plane or point to line uh, matching uh, as a criteria for correspondence matching, which is one of the most important things of the ICP algorithm. So, so let's look at this, this sort of problem setting. So uh, we have a point PI um, in the current scan, and then we have a line segment of the, the previous scan. Let's say uh, PJ was the previous time step, or we have a corresponding line segment from the previous scan. So point to point uh, or closest point matching would look like this, right? So you would literally look at, well, the closest point in this pre, uh, uh, compared to the previous scan is PJ zero. Uh, so this is my uh, distance that I will use in my, uh, you know, um, to evaluate the, the the match between PI and uh, the line segment that I have, right? So you are literally looking at the the distance to the nearest point on the segment or or the previous scan, um, and that's what point to point is. What point to line would suggest is that instead of the closest point, we actually find the, the projection of PI on the line which contains this previous scan or the line segment. So visually what we are looking for is, if we were to hypothetically extend this scan either side, such that this line segment is a part of this generic line, then what would be the normal the the projection of pi normal to this line right so that's the point we are looking at and that's why it's called point to line or point to plane uh, more more generically so we are finding it, the distance to the nearest line which contains the segment uh, um, of pj okay so so that's and in some cases both may lead to the same point right so um so you may have this line segment over here, uh, and so you, we, we, we may see that you know there may be a point here on, on the line segment PJ, and so in some cases, the, um, the point to line and point to point could lead to the same uh, closest match. 
but that might not always be the the case but you know it can sometimes happen but the the more important question is well why does it matter why is one preferable over the other in this case i want to show why point to line uh, could be faster in in some simplified examples so so let's jump into that right so let's look at why point to line is a better way rather than point to point right so uh, here's my setting we have uh, the scan at time t equals k and we have a new scan at times t uh, equals k plus one okay so uh, what icp will tell us is we need to uh, transform this new scan the green one uh, in some iterative steps so that it becomes closer and closer to the previous scan uh, so without really getting into the weeds and the uh, details of it let's look at some possible transformations right so let's say our first transform q of zero it takes the green scan into this pink uh, coordinates uh, which are the transformed coordinates of my scan at tk plus one and i can keep going q1 is another possibility q2 is another you can see how it's getting closer and closer to this uh, you know a blue uh, original scan at time tk um, so let's look at if these were the the iterations of the ICP um, uh, algorithm, Q, Q0, Q1, and Q2, uh, how would the closest uh, uh, correspondence or the closest point matching work in this case? Right, so, so we can look at say Q0, and then we can say what are the closest points to each of the three points in my transformed um, scan from TK plus one, which is given by this Q naught uh, points or, or the points in pink. So we know that for the left point A, uh, we can say that A naught is the closest distance. Uh, similarly for point B, B naught is the closest and for point C, C naught is the closest. So we would evaluate this transform Q naught by looking at the sum of the distances a naught, b naught, and c naught, because that's exactly what we just did with our very first example, All right? So we have our the distance between the two points, as described by the transform q naught, is given by this expression. Okay, everybody good so far? This is pretty straightforward. Now let's see what happens when we go to q one. So when we go to q one from q naught. Uh, the correspondence doesn't change, right? So this bottom uh, point is still the closest one for each of the points. However, because we have moved relative to, uh, you know, this transform Q naught, these distances themselves have changed, right? So A1, B1, C1 are the new distances. So at Q naught, we had some distance. Uh, at Q1, we have another distance and so on and, and so forth. Uh, if we keep going to Q2, maybe the correspondence does change for one of these points, but we'll get another distance. All right, so I'm just giving you some examples of uh, how these distances might evolve. You may be wondering, how did you come up with Q0, Q1, and Q2? That's not the point of this uh, exercise. Um, I want to show that for the same transforms, but with different techniques, why is one better than the other? So, so everybody good so far that we have different distance expressions for each candidate uh, uh, in the iterative uh, uh, search for this transform. And what is of note is to observe that each of these distances are unique. They are different because the position of the transform point is always changing with respect to our uh, original scan. And that's why the closest point distances keep changing every step or every iteration of the algorithm. So that's what is of note here, right? So three iterations of our ICP have each led to a different distance. Uh, and it might be improving, it might be getting worse. That's a different story. But each of them is a separate distance. That's why you needed to evaluate every transform separately. Now let's look at the same transforms. And that's why this analysis is transform independent because they are exactly the same transforms. The only thing we are changing is instead of doing closest point matching, we will be doing point to line matching. So we are going to project each point 
to the closest line which contains a line segment of the previous scan. That's a mouthful, but that's what it is. Okay, so, so let's look at again Q0 and with point to line, this distance A0 prime to the green line segment, which passes through you know, the uh, uh, part of this line segment of the original scan, it's, uh, it's the closest one compared to maybe, you know, just to show you, we can project this to this line segment as well, but visually you can tell that's going to be uh, uh, longer. Okay, so, so we have A0 prime as the point to line for A. Similarly, we'll have B0 prime as the distance to point to line for point B and C0 prime for point C. Okay, so I hope this picture clarifies visually what point to line does compared to point to point. And we will sum up these distances. So the transform distance at Q0 is A0 prime, B0 prime, and C0 prime. You can square them and you can massage the data however you want, but that's the sum of the distances. So let's look at the next transform, Q1 which was the same as in the previous uh, previous uh, iteration of you know point to point so when we go to from q0 to q1 we have a1 prime b1 prime and c1 prime and our new distance is the sum of these three projected distances from point to line but if you have already seen it a1 prime and a0 prime B0 prime and B1 prime, C0 prime and C1 prime are the same as what they were at Q0, right? You can see that these two distances will evaluate to exactly the same measure of closeness. And then we can go to Q2 and reach a point where instead of looking at this as the closest projection for point A, this actually becomes the closest projection for point A. And now you will get a unique distance because even though B2 and C2 are the same as before for all the transforms, A2 is the new one and they are still the same. Okay, so we went from Q0 to Q1 to Q2, just like we did with point to point. The only subtle distance is, uh, difference is that between Q0 and Q1 for point to line, uh, we didn't obtain any benefit. Meaning that with point to line metric in ICP, you would directly go from Q0 all the way to Q2. So you would take fewer steps, in this case one fewer step, one out of basically three steps. With point to line, the next iteration will go directly from Q0 to Q2, and therefore it is faster than point to point. And I've shown this for a simple example, but in general, this also works because it's reducing the, the number of steps of the algorithm uh, while still preserving this measure of closeness of uh, between two different scans. Okay, so all this trouble to get to this point that point to line uh, is a little bit better, faster than point to point for uh, for certain examples, right? So. Um, uh, I can't claim it's always better, but in general, it's faster and leads to similar results in terms of closeness. Okay, so now getting close to wrapping this, this video up, um, it's important to acknowledge and discuss some limitations and assumptions that we are making in this process of ICP. Uh, goes without saying that we are assuming that the rate at which you get new scans is faster than the speed at which, let's say, your robot is moving. Uh, meaning, if your robot moves so much that there is no overlap between what you see at time um, tk plus one compared to where you were at time tk, because your LiDAR was so slow that you have moved to a different part in the world, there is no possible overlap, then ICP will not good, uh, yield good results. In fact, I doubt any algorithm uh, maybe dead reckoning is the best thing you can do in that sense. And you may be wondering, that's, you know, that's usually not a problem for self-driving vehicles. These LIDARs are very, very fast. Uh, but I'll give you one interesting snippet of information. Like we are, 
uh, trying to program a full-scale Indy race car as part of our uh, university's Cavalier Autonomous Racing Team. And there, the vehicle can go up to, you know, 180 miles per hour, which is very fast. No company out there is testing self-driving at those speeds. And so, you know, at that speed, you begin to observe a little slew, not anything, you know, um, groundbreaking uh, between subsequent scans. So the, the number of points which overlap at, say, 50 miles per hour um, compared to 180 miles per hour is a lot less, a lot fewer, uh, because of the speed at which the, the robot is traveling is slowly starting to be comparable to the scan rate of this uh, sensor. Uh, but usually that's not a problem. Uh, and the other problem is that we are assuming that there are features in the in the environment, right? So all of this, um, at the end of the day, depends upon matching features um, between scans with each other, whether that's through point-to-point, point, point to uh, line or normal shooting and things like that. Um, so if there are no features to begin with, then ICP will struggle. I'll show you an example of that uh, in just a second. So, so how does this affect the F110 car? Well, well let's say uh, we are given this LiDAR scan at time T1, right? So this is what it looks like uh, from uh, in our map frame or in the frame of reference uh, of the LiDAR. Uh, and we know the car is facing you know, right. So this green arrow is the pose of the car. And then at time uh, T2, we get new scan data. And the question is, uh, how has the car moved relative to time T1. And what scan matching uh, does for the F110 car is it will find the transform of this new scan at time T2 such that it has a maximal overlap or is closest to our previous known scan at T1. And you can see visually, you know, that's what is going on. It's picking up, you know, this, this feature right here, perhaps of interest. Uh, it's picking up, you know, this edge a little bit, although uh, this is missing from the new scan. Uh, and maybe it's also picking up, you know, the distance between kind of uh, this corridor or hallway. So whatever it is doing, it's working quite well. And you can see that the estimated new transform when applied gives us the new pose of the car. Then the new green arrow is the most likely transform of how the car has moved in the world. And that's really how scan matching works, right? So uh, if we break it down to each individual point, uh, on the left, you see a reference scan at time some, some other time. On the right, you see the current laser scan, and you are computing the transform. In this case, it's a simple transform, uh, and this is the closest point output of uh, ICP or scan matching. Okay, so uh, it works pretty well, and that's what we use on the 110th algorithm, the 110th scale car. Um, the requirement is we need a fast LiDAR. So that's why we use these Hakuyo 10LX, 4LX LiDAR. They're pretty uh, high scan frequency. Um, and then, yeah, it's not really a risk for most LiDARs. But another uh, requirement is that your surfaces are uh, non-smooth, right? So if you're literally talking about a hallway or a track, uh, if the track is like a singular metal plate, then there's no features to match, right? So subsequent scans will look exactly like previous scans because it's just going to be a single line because there is no feature on a smooth plate or a smooth wall. So you cannot distinguish between whether your car has moved and you are getting new uh, scans which look exactly like the previous scan or you haven't moved at all. You can distinguish between the two. Uh, and so that's a requirement that we need to have some features for the LiDAR point clouds to latch onto and for scan matching to work. So here's actually an example of a failed uh, scan matching uh, um, um, experiment. So you see we are in a corridor and you will see in a bit the scans start to come in, but we are not able to figure out uh, how we are moving in the environment. There are, there are these abrupt jumps and then we just lose the, the position of the car. Um, and so that's because there weren't enough uh, homogeneous features in the environment uh, to latch onto. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you see scan matching failing, you may want to look at the rate of scan of the LiDAR and the uh, features in the environment in which you're trying to, to localize. All right, so, so to finish this lecture off, I'm going to very quickly uh, uh, go over a very popular method called uh, uh, NDT scan matching. 
And the idea uh, I sort of already presented uh, before. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I have uh, taken the liberty of uh, using some slides uh, prepared by uh, Apex AI. I want to just acknowledge that I'm using their slides. Um, but I think they did a good job of showing how NDT works. And so the idea of uh, a normal um, sort of NDT scan matching is the following that we've already uh, discussed this, that sometimes we don't want to match every single point, but we want to match features instead. So while there be maybe other methods of determining features, one idea is, uh, let's say you have a, a, a bunch of different points, right? So you, we are shown this X, Y plane, and you are showing, we are shown a lot of different points, uh, maybe a few thousand of them bundled together in this plane. And so what we try to do is we try to find the normal distribution which best describes this cluster of points. And that's what we are calling like a feature, right? So if you if you recall what is a normal distribution, it's just an exponential function uh, given by this expression. And you can describe this entire uh, distribution using just a mean and a covariance. And so that's very convenient, right? Because you all of a sudden went from, let's say a few uh, thousand 2D points to just two parameters to describe this entire uh, feature. And so then when you get to the point of uh, ICP, uh, you will not be matching to each individual point. You will just look at the new points and try to reason which transform gives the highest probability of certain points falling in certain Gaussian distributions, right? So I hope uh, that summarizes what it does. Uh, and so here's a picture to, uh, you know, worth a thousand explanations. So we have, let's say, uh, the original scan, which is a bunch of different points that we are used to seeing. Uh, we can divide our region into some grids. So you already are making, uh, you know, an additional step and the reason for that is that for each grid cell, we want to identify the normal distribution transform or NDT that will best describe the cluster of you know, um, points in that cell. So you can see how for this cell, uh, this is the best representation of that transform, right? So, and we can do that using uh, uh, some known techniques. How do you find this uh, distribution itself? So what we have done is we have gone from our original map to a transform map where the transform map does not have any uh, points at all for doing any closest point stuff. It is just a grid cell with some normal distribution in every cell which was occupied. So you can either have a normal distribution or the cell is empty, right? One or, one or the other. So how do you do scan matching with this? Well, it's very clever. What you do is you have your previous step as the set of normal distributed points. And then you get a new scan, right? You get the green scan. And our idea is to find the transform for the green scan such that we maximize the probability um, of, of the points, uh, which you know leads to the, the best overlap between the new scans and the known and sort of the known fitted a normal distribution transforms, right? So, so uh, we can define, first of all, the probability of a point uh, belonging to each cell C, right? So each of these cells has a normal distribution. So for each point, we can describe the probability of a point belonging to that cell. And basically the idea is that if there are a large number of points with high probability, then chances are that that's the best orientation of the green data with respect to our previous uh, map frame or our previous data set. Okay, so, so we have gone from comparing raw points and point to line to comparing uh, normal distributed transforms. And that's really what NDT algorithm does. So here are the steps outlined for that. I won't uh, just read them out, uh, just, you, know, you have the, you can pause the video and go through all these steps. They are very similar to the ICP algorithm, but instead of the metric being closest distance or projected line distance, here we are talking in terms of likelihood of points belonging to a particular normal distribution. And that's again, like a known mathematical method. 
Okay, so uh, the important thing to know is this is also an iterative process, right? So that's, again, it has some common DNA with the ICP. Um, so we have some initial guess and we look at the likelihood of the points and we you know, maybe uh, um, summarize them with some average likelihood or a score of the sum of all likelihoods. And then we, again, you know, transform our data based on how well we did until we converge to maximal likelihood between the new scan and the NDT view of the, the previous scan. Okay, so this algorithm is, is, is pretty popular. It's used uh, uh, quite a lot in full self-driving car. This is also part of the open source AutoWare stack. Uh, and it has many um, advantages. First of all, the representation of the map is very sparse. So we are not dealing with raw points anymore. We are dealing with uh, this uh, efficient sampling where you are summarizing thousands of points with just two parameters. So it's, you know, faster, it has low memory requirement, but it needs that pre-processing, right? And also, if there are outliers in your original data, uh, so if you have a cloud of points, but there are some points in the periphery, the uh, normalization would take care of that. It will automatically like reject some of these outliers. So it's more robust to, to noisy data. And I have some you know references listed here for you to check out uh, if you are interested in knowing more about, about this algorithm in particular. So for our purposes, we mostly will be working with the, the following uh, packages. So we have uh, Hokuyo node. Uh, I don't think that's used anymore. The, the node we will use to interact with the LiDAR, and this is for the real F110 car, uh, it's called the URG node. And so this is what publishes the laser scan topic that we will get the raw values from in order to do scan matching. Uh, there is an actual package in ROS called laser scan match, uh, matcher. Uh, which does uh, uh, you know this the scan matching uh, based on an algorithm called CSM canonical scan matching. Uh, it is using this ICP idea itself, uh, and you know it subscribe you, you sort of subscribe to uh, the scan messages, and then you can specify some properties of your ICP algorithm, uh, and you know that will be reflected in the accuracy and the computation efficacy of this uh, this method. Uh, so just to show you what these parameters may look like, um, you can define the number of maximum iterative closest point cycle iterations, uh, the maximum correspondence distance, uh, other sort of correlations between the scan, uh, and uh, you, can def you can also do some sort of looks like outlier detection. So laser scan matcher is a pretty popular package which does most of the scan matching. And we will use actually some of the outputs of the scan matcher to build our map uh, in the next segment of this course when we talk about SLAM algorithms. Finally, there is something called uh, scan tools. It provides uh, some examples and a bunch of very useful tools to visualize the pose, estimated pose of scan matching uh, and things like that. So uh, you feel free to check these, um, check these out. Uh, and when we switch to the F110 simulator, we will use some of these uh, packages uh, for you to interact with the simulator, understand the laser scan data, because you'll use your laser scan data for the very first lab uh, with the F110 simulator, which is coming soon. So yeah, with that, let me pause here. This has been a slightly longer uh, lecture than usual, but I believe this was uh, much needed to cover this uh, very important topic of uh, scan matching and localization for the uh, F110 autonomous race car. Um, and so it's a very ubiquitous, widely used method. Uh, it is, you know, many aspects of which are still uh, research problems. Right? It's a correspondence match. If you can come up with a, with a better mousetrap, then that's, a, you know, an actual research contribution, although it's going to be quite difficult because a lot of people have looked into many different aspects of scan matching itself. Um, but how, what can you do at high speeds? Uh, how do you, you know, fuse this with other sensing information? These are all good directions to pursue in terms of research topics in this domain. Uh, so with that, I will uh, conclude this video lecture on uh, scan matching. And this also sort of uh, uh, is the initial, you know, completion of some of the perception stuff I wanted to cover. We will revisit perception from the perspective of uh, images and cameras uh, later in the course. But for now, uh, I think you know enough to understand how the F110 car localizes itself in an unknown environment, 
uh, by using this uh, sort of iterative closes point based uh, scan matching with the 2D LiDAR, plus a uh, possibility of fusing some initial guesses or information from the IMU uh, on both the vehicle as well. So I hope this was useful and uh, uh, I will see you again in the next lecture. Yeah.